The China Model, Political Meritocracy and the Limits of Democracy. I'm Heather Godwin, and this is Bookmarks. Welcome to Bookmarks. I'm your host, Heather Godwin. China has been an ongoing fascination among political scientists in the West, with its mix of political communism and economic capitalism. Some have even pointed out ways that the United States could learn from China in crafting its own political system. This is the subject of a new book, The China Model, Political Meritocracy and the Limits of Democracy by Daniel Bell. Professor Bell joins us via Skype. He is chair professor of the Schwarzman Scholars Program at Tsinghua University in Beijing and director of the Bergwin Institute of Philosophy and Culture. His books include Spirit of Cities, China's New Confucianism, Beyond Liberal Democracy, and East Meets West. And also joining us via Skype to critique the book is Stein Ringen of the University of Oxford. He is Emeritus Professor of Sociology and Social Policy at Green Templeton College at Oxford and a visiting professor at Richmond, the American International University in London. He has worked as a high government official in his native Norway, in international organizations, and as a political journalist. He has held visiting professorships and fellowships around the world. His most recent book is Nation of Devils, Democratic Leadership and the Problem of Obedience. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. So, Professor Bell, could you give us, in a nutshell, the main thesis of your book? Well, let me just say what motivated it. I've been teaching in Beijing for 11 years, and I had been working mainly on the philosophy of Confucianism. And it's only in the past few years that I noticed that there's a very strong way in which Confucianism affects the political system. At least in form, it's very similar to what you had in imperial China. Because for about 1,300 years until the early 20th century, when the imperial system collapsed, government officials were recruited first by examinations and then by means of performance evaluations at lower levels of government. And in form, that's more or less the almost in the past 30 years, that's what has been re-established in China. Of course, the content of the examinations is different, and what counts as good performance is different, but the kind of imperial system has been uh, re-established. So, so I began to pay much more attention to that. And this, and that this ideal of, um, so what is my method? Well, my method really is to look at history, look at philosophy, look at social science, as well as look at what reformers and intellectuals in China think. And on this basis, I, I developed this view that political meritocracy, the idea that the political system should aim to select and promote leaders with superior quality, superior ability, social skills, and virtue, is really the underlying ideal that motivates political reform in China over the past uh, three decades or so, but there's still a big gap between the reality and the ideal. So what I did in this book is I tried to articulate, make coherent, what is this ideal of political meritocracy? It also has some democratic characteristics, meaning that there's democracy at lower levels of government, there's a certain amount of transparency and, and other features of, of democracy. So we can call it a model of democratic meritocracy, but it's still highly, it's again, there's still a big gap between the ideal and the reality. But what's interesting is that if you want to understand the process of political reform in China, it makes sense to use this kind of, this, this language. And whereas in the West, of course, I'm from Montreal, so we tend to think that there's only two forms of, we tend to divide the political world into good democracies, where leaders are selected by elections, whether it's a small community of 100 or a big country of a billion, and bad authoritarian regimes, which is all the rest. Now, I'm saying that's not very useful to understand China. I mean, if you lump up China with, you know, North Korea, which is like really a criminal state, mm. a family-run dictatorship, you know, and, 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 and other, and Egypt and other places, it won't, it won't, really doesn't get to the essence of what's happening in China. So again, my point is that in China, there is this ideal of political meritocracy. It has influenced political reform over the past 30 years, but there's still a big gap between the ideal and the reality. And I argue that what I call this political model should continue to serve as a standard to judge political progress and regress. 
And the political model basically is this, that democracy, local forms of government, there's a very good case to make for that because at the local level, we know the quality of our leaders and the issues are not so complex. But the further up you move the chain of political command, the more meritocratic the process should be because it takes, requires a lot of experience to make informed decisions. Um, and and, and so, so basically the model is democracy, lower forms of government, political meritocracy at the top with lots of experimentation in between the lower and, and higher forms of government. And to be frank, my views are quite mainstream in China uh, among uh, political reformers, among intellectuals. Of course, not everybody agrees. But in the West, they're often viewed as controversial, I think, for two reasons. One is that I'm often, I, I think, misunderstood to be defending the actual Chinese political system. But again, I'm defending an ideal, which should serve as a standard for evaluating the political system. So it's a very critical perspective on the political reality. Okay. And two, and two, finally, I'm questioning this view that one person, one vote is the only morally legitimate way of, of selecting political leaders. Thank you. And Professor Ringen, I understand that you have some criticisms of the book. Well, yes, I do. Um, but not only criticisms. There's a great deal that I would agree with Daniel about. I think we agree on two things, basic things, and that is that the Chinese system, the Chinese model, is completely unique. It's something absolutely to itself, and it needs to be understood on its own terms, including on its own historical terms, as Daniel is very careful to do. And the other thing I think we agree on is that it's an effective system. It's an a system that is in control. Now, there's a whole lot of people who look at China and think that it's just full of contradictions and it's going to collapse at any time. I don't believe that. I don't think Daniel believes that. It's, it's an effective system. So we agree on that, I think. But then we disagree on some things, and that's what it's effective for. It's effective on its own terms. What is, if, what is it effective for? And I think my main criticism of Daniel's book is that it deals with the state, but it doesn't take power into consideration. The Chinese system is a system that runs on power and that power is used for dictatorial purposes. It's a dictatorship and power um, is constituted so as to make the di dictatorship work effectively, work perfectly in my opinion. It's the perfect dictatorship. So I think we, we agree on many analysis of how the system works, but we disagree somewhat on what it works for. Daniel believes, I think, you'll correct me, that meritocratic selection of leaders is an essential characteristic of the system, at least that it can be, that it has the potential. I would downplay that very much, and I would think that the essential characteristic characteristics of the system is that it's a power system for dictatorial purposes. I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air toward the end of the show. Should I respond? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course power is part of the story, but I think we need to differentiate between China and other systems like North Korea, which, which I think fit better uh, your description. I mean, political officials or public officials in China are not promoted just on the basis of power. I'm not sure what that could explain. They're promoted on the basis of, there's this, there is, as you know, there's this Department of Organization, which is like a human resources organization within the, the Chinese Communist Party. And they have very clear criteria for deciding when public officials can be promoted. And power is it's not in a category in that. So. Usually, and there's lots of studies that, uh, of course, it's not only that, but in the past 30 years, um, at least until they get to the very top, the ability to promote economic growth, or at least um, ability, to, because there's been a consensus in China until recently that the key issue should be poverty reduction. Mm. How do we do that? Well, the best means is economic growth. So as a result, over the past 30 years, public officials tended to be promoted based on whether or not they succeeded in promoting economic growth in the districts over which they were uh, governing. 
Um, of course, that wasn't always the case, but there's lots of studies, and I, and I refer to them in my book, which show that to a certain extent that was a key characteristic. I mean, and how could we explain that this, I think we can call it an economic miracle over the last three decades by hundreds of millions of people being lifted out of poverty. I mean, we can argue it may have worked differently in a different political system, but that's totally counterfactual. And I, and I don't, I, don't, I don't think this category of power can, can help us to explain um, what China has done, as well as what it currently needs to do to reform. Well, there's, of course, no doubt that, no question that China has been growing very strongly, nor is there any question that, as a result, there are much fewer people who live in dire poverty in China. But I don't think it's right to say that the reduction of poverty has been the uh, utmost aim of the uh, Chinese regime. The number one aim of the Chinese regime has been to retain the position of the Chinese regime, to retain the party state. And I think that in the selection process of officials, the criteria are maybe not as clear as Daniel would suggest, that they differ over time. They differ between uh, in different provinces, for example. But a very strong criterion always in promotion is the ability to maintain stability, to maintain political control. So I see the recruitment system, uh, which is used uh, for promotions, very much as an instrument of control from above to recruit officials who are competent, but also loyal. Now, maybe I should just add on this issue of competence that one of the big understandings that was achieved, that came through with Deng Xiaoping, was that the regime needed to reward people. They, they couldn't rely on ideology. They needed to distribute rewards in the population. And to the population at large, that was mainly economic rewards. In my view, that's been a very important part of the governance of China in the period of reform and opening up. But it has not been the purpose. It has not been the supreme purpose. It has been a means which has been recognized as necessary for the supreme purpose, which is the preservation of the uh, uh, party state. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I agree in the abstract that the, the government isn't going to enact policies that will lead to the destruction of the political system, but I'm not sure how much work uh, that idea can do. I mean, it's true that stability matters when it comes to the promotion process, but it's more like if you if, if there's lots of instability, then you won't get promoted. But it's certainly not a sufficient criterion to explain who gets promoted and who doesn't. If all you do is preside over, uh, if, all, if a, a public official, all they do is govern over a district where things are stable, but there's no economic growth or other things, they're not, that's not going to get them very far. Um, and, and I agree, though, that the criteria for selection is changing because there's no longer a consensus that poverty reduction is the overwhelming goal of China. S some parts of China are still very poor where that matters, but other parts, like Shanghai, for example, they don't even use GDP growth anymore when it comes to measuring the performance of public officials because other things matter. Um, and now, clearly, China has other hugely pressing issues, environmental sustainability, reduction of gap between rich and poor. So different parts of China are experimenting with different criteria for the selection and promotion of political leaders. A, a, a city called Hangzhou near Shanghai is, is relying more and more on environmental sustainability as a criterion for the promotion of public officials. Chengdu is, is, think, is experimenting with promotion officials based on their ability to reduce income gap between rural and urban residents. There's a huge bureaucracy. It's, if we want to understand the Chinese political system, it doesn't. I don't think it's very helpful to just say it's all about power. That doesn't get us very far, and it doesn't help to differentiate China from truly horrible regimes like North Korea, which will do anything to maintain power. You know, China, I mean, there are. Oh, let's put it this way: there, I think there are moral limits on what China would do to, on what the Chinese government would do to maintain power that don't apply in truly horrible regimes 
like North Korea. And there's a huge bureaucracy in place to select and promote public officials, which doesn't exist in, in, in other you know, non-democratic countries. I, I, so that's why I just, of course, power is important. And one of the problems of political democracy, sorry, of political meritocracy is that we need to think about how to limit the power of officials who aren't accountable by means of democratic elections. I think there are ways of doing that. Um, but so, and I also agree that the whole promotion process is not as transparent as it should be. And no doubt there are lots of behind the scenes power struggles, which explains who gets here and there. But that's not the whole story. In fact, arguably, that's not the main story. We have some questions from viewers. Um, now, of course, the United States is working towards common core testing in public schools. Do you think that that's actually a move towards a meritocratic system for the US? And, and Stein, I know that you have some opinions on democracy as well. I'd love to hear from you about that, too. Uh, should we start with you, Stein? All right, well, the, that situation in the US, I don't know enough about to comment on it. But maybe I should say that you know, democratic systems are also, in their way, very meritocratic in the way they select officials and leaders. Not by using formal examination uh, procedures, but that uh, it takes um, uh, a great deal to, to be able to become a high official. I mean, the election process and the nomination processes are intensely competitive, mm. and they are, at least ideally, aimed at rooting out people who are not competent or virtuous and of encouraging and selecting during the process people who are competent and, uh, and virtuous. So this distinction between meritocracy on the one hand and democracy on the other hand is one which I wouldn't uh, accept uh, very much. Uh, there's, a, there's a difference in form, but democracy is and is intended to be a meritocratic system for selecting leaders and officials. Um, so I, I agree that meritocracy is a strong part of democratic systems as well, but I think it's more prominent when it comes to the selection and promotion process of civil servants who are there, at least in principle, to implement the decisions of elected leaders. The, the way of selecting leaders is by means of elections. And in principle, it, it doesn't require any experience, right? I mean, think about it. A state is the only major organization where no experience is required. I mean, no corporation or university would select a leader, you know, regardless of whether or not they have experience. So in principle, anybody could be elected uh, regardless of how much experience they are or how qualified they are. The advantages of political meritocracy is that it requires decades-long experience to rise to the top. And also leaders are not bound by thinking about it, pleasing the people because they're worried about, um, about the next election. And they don't have to spend so much time campaigning and giving the same speech over and over again. They have, they're more worried about performing well. Now, in, so those are the advantages of political meritocracy. The disadvantages, as, as noted, is that there's, it's very important to limit their power with, in ways that are uh, that, that don't include democratic elections, because democratic elections, would, I think, would literally wreck the whole uh, meritocratic system at the top. How can you do that? Well, in China, you have age limits and you have term limits. And to be frank, if Xi Jinping doesn't resign at the end of two terms, that would be terrible. That would be a disaster for the whole meritocratic system. But I agree, and probably here Stein agrees as well, that um, there's a need for many other democratic mechanisms within the Chinese political system to... Uh, precisely to limit their, the power of leaders, including I'm all in favor of more free speech, um, mm -hmm. more independent supervisory institutions, and, and, and more freedom of association, short of the right to form political parties to challenge the very top. You can have all that. You can even have a referendum. I mean, in my book, I argue that if there's a referendum, let's say in 15 years' time, on the, on the, on the political system, asking the people to endorse it in a free and fair referendum, it would give it legitimacy and stability, and they wouldn't have to uh, be so cautious and, and paranoid and imprison uh, dissidents who, who disagree uh, with the political system. Now, no, if, to, just if, to, to answer the if, question. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Stein. If Daniel, the regime won that referendum. If they won that referendum. Right, of course. Um, if, 
if they lost the referendum, what would happen? Well, the Chinese Communist Party, a bit like in Mexico, they, they would have to run in elections. And as the most successful, um, or let's say as the most effective and large organization, they would probably still win at least some elections. But the meritocratic aspects of the system w would be severely undermined. So it might not be, uh, so might not necessarily be bad news for the Chinese Communist Party, but I think it would be bad news for the effort to, to build up a, a meritocratic system. So the next question, and we'll start with you, Stein, is how much do cultural and demographic differences play into China's politics versus the United States? Well, demographic differences are incredibly important. Uh, China is in a bad situation demographically, with very low birth rates, uh, uh, a train of aging which is coming down the tracks to hit the system with enormous speed in a way never seen any, anywhere before. So in the growth period, uh, the system had good demographics in its back. Now it's butting up against bad demographics. Uh, the demographics in America are more stable, uh, partly helped by immigration. And the economy is better underpinned by good demographics uh, in the US than in China. And these two countries are really contrasts in the world now with um, economically good demographics in America and economically bad demographics in China. The culture, I think there's a tendency in the West to overestimate the importance of culture when we look at China and to be in, in a way in awe um, of uh, China's cultural inscrutability. I think in this respect, it's more an ordinary system and that we, at least in the West, should be very careful by resorting to cultural stereotypes and cultural language when dealing with China. I, I, I agree with um, the first part about demographics, although I'm not sure it's as dangerous as, as Stein suggests. I mean, I, I, but I, I guess the main point to me is that demographics, it's really about a huge country. Mm. Um, the, what we need to govern a huge country is different than what is needed to govern you know, a small country like Denmark, you know, which is like the pop, you know, population of Denmark, you can fit, fit four Denmarks just in Beijing in terms of population. Um, so I, I do think that democratic systems tend to work better in small, other things being equal, democratic systems work better in small, uh, small countries than in huge countries um, like China. So if I knew nothing else about the, the country, I would say that, you know, a political meritocracy fits better in, in a large country. Now, about culture, I mean, I, of course, we need to worry about stereotypes, but we shouldn't assume that what we think about political values and culture and what we learned about in the West is transferable to China without knowing about China, right? I mean, that's also a mistake. We shouldn't universalize our own political values and think that they're transferable to other countries without knowing um, about other countries. So I think if we think about culture, it makes sense to begin on the basis of China's own history and culture, try to make sense of its political culture, of its political experience, look at political surveys, what people think now, and then we would realize that there are important differences uh, compared to the leading political culture uh, in, in, in most Western countries. You know, for, I mean, the, the value of social harmony, um, the, the idea that uh, the political, that this a value of political meritocracy, according, it's consistent in political surveys, you know, and it, of course the dominant ideals in Chinese history as well, um, it's different than, for example, American culture, which would value freedom and so on. I'm not saying that freedom isn't valuable and shouldn't, doesn't matter in China, but at least the way that values are ranked and prioritized, we should allow for the possibility that there are differences and, and not, not assume that what we think of as the best way of organizing a political society is transferable to other places. So China has a rich and beautiful culture uh, itself, a rich and beautiful history, and, and it, it, it makes sense on the face of it that that, that culture and history should shape its, its political outlooks as well as what we should consider as standards for judging political progress and regress. Great, thank you. We have another question uh, from Sherman Brewer. Isn't China's human rights record enough to dismiss its political system entirely? And Stein, we'll start with you. No. Uh, I mean, of course, it's a, uh, as I said, it's a dictatorial system. That's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the other way of expressing it. But it's not enough to say 
that it is a dictatorial system that does not respect human rights. It is also a system that has been delivering. Uh, and although you will understand that I'm not a fan of the Chinese model as it is today, I think that if any sort of idea that this model should collapse would be taken away would be a disaster. I mean, this is, this is dangerous territory. Dangerous territory, not because it deserves to be preserved, but because if it, I mean, if, if China went into serious instability again, it would be a human disaster on monumental proportions. So what I would hope for in China is a gradual transition towards more a more open society. I don't have very much hopes for that, but that's what I would hope for. And I would not advocate any kind of dismissal of the Chinese regime because of its human rights records. That is dangerous. It's not because I think it's deserved, but I think it's dangerous to argue that. In, in terms of hope, I agree with Stein that I also hope for a more open society, but maybe here we disagree, short of one person, one vote to choose top leaders, because I do think that would undermine uh, the, the advantages of the meritocratic system. Um, in terms of the human rights record, I mean, of, uh, you know, of course there's tons of human rights problem in China, but if we use a comprehensive notion of human rights, including social and economic rights, and you compare China to other countries at similar levels of economic development, it's not, it's not necessarily terrible. That said, I, there, the human rights issues now, you know, constraints on freedom of speech which have gotten worse over the past two years, imprisoning of lawyers and so on just doesn't make sense, you know, and there's a level of paranoia in the system. I think it's related to the anti-corruption campaign because there's so many enemies now against, for every, you know, for every political leader who's picked off in the anti-corruption campaign, there's one or two hundred under them who also view their uh, prospects in, in a negative light. So within this organization now, there's so many enemies within the party that the current leadership is in a very paranoid uh, st state of mind now. I don't think that could last. Maybe here I'm a bit optim more optimistic than Stein. I think that it's bound in the long term, especially once the anti-corruption campaign is successful. They won't be so worried anymore about the legitimacy of, the, of at least the leaders will, won't be viewed as corrupt and hence not meritocratic. And then they could eventually relax. Okay, that's all we have time for. Again, the book is The China Model, Political Meritocracy and the Limits of Democracy by Daniel Bell of Tsinghua University. Thanks to Professor Bell for discussing the book and to Stein Ringen of the University of Oxford for his critique. And thank you for watching Bookmarks. I'm Heather Godwin, and we'll see you next time.